I grew up in a very rural area in the deep woods of Maine. We had maybe four neighbors in a 10 mile radius, and not having a TV or video games, I spent all my free time exploring the forest, the mountains, and caves around my home. On my 12th birthday, myself and a group of friends got together to celebrate as well. There was a mountain in the forest near my house, and half of the group of kids wanted to go to the mountain to play manhunt, seven of us, which was a version of tag in which two teams split off, one hiding while the other team searched for them. When found, they had to be tagged, and then they'd be put in the dungeon of the capturing team on the other side of the mountain. I'd like to preface this too by saying that weird stuff has happened on this mountain in the past as well. For instance, I would sometimes hear flutes and drums in the forest while on it, and even brought friends up without telling them, and they would get creeped out and say, oh my goodness, can you hear that? Other times I would just get a, a weird feeling, nothing scary, just that maybe I shouldn't be there or something. But half my friends didn't feel like playing on the mountain anyway, not sure why. So in mid-afternoon, the rest of us hiked up into the forest and set up the respective camps on each side of the mountain. We established a perimeter for playing, and my team was given five minutes to hide. And knowing the mountain better than anyone, I chose the best hiding spot. It was down the mountainside, where a triangle of rock sort of jutted straight outwards. A picture of the rock and the Lion King where Baby Simba is first presented to the world. A bit like that. It was really hidden from above, though. One having to climb down a certain way to even get to it. And once crouched on it, no one could see you from above, unless they climbed down. From below there was maybe a 20 foot drop and no one could see you there either unless they went a good distance away from the mountain and could see it as a hole or something. But several minutes went by and I heard my friends laughing and running getting discovered and tagged but at some point all the sounds just immediately stopped. At first I chalked it up to everyone being found and me being the last one left but all sounds had stopped. The birds stopped chirping, the insects stopped buzzing, and the wind and the trees even completely ceased. It was so quiet, in fact, that my own breath seemed really loud, and all I remember thinking was, that's weird. And then, all I can describe it as is a monstrous growl erupted straight over my head. I've never heard anything like it. It was like a lion, but sort of different. More guttural, I would describe it as, and sounded like the animal was much bigger. I honestly thought at first that it was a mountain lion, but either way, I was frozen immediately with fear and dread. The sound came from right above me, but I'd heard no footsteps on the rock. I got the feeling that it knew right where I was. I couldn't drop down or go up, and I was officially trapped there. The thing growled again, and always being a pretty brave or stupid kid, I suppose, I jumped up from my hiding spot screaming murder and flailing my arms like a nut job, ready to split away from this creature all the way to the other side of the mountain. But when I did, nothing was there. Given the very short amount of time that had elapsed since I heard the second growl, it would have been impossible for whatever it was to disappear completely from sight so quickly. This side of the mountain was bald rock, by the way. Strangely enough as well, as soon as I was back up, all the sounds returned and now my friends were screaming my name. I ran through the trees to the other side of the mountain where all my friends were gathered together in some distress. My friend said, where were you? Apparently very angry with me and sort of worried as well. Hiding, I told him, confused. And he proceeded to tell me that... They'd been yelling my name for 10 minutes because weird stuff was happening and they wanted to just go home. He honestly thought that something bad had happened to me. The mountain wasn't that big and it would have been impossible for me to not hear them, especially since they were combing the whole mountain calling my name. I knew that something was off and so I asked, what weird stuff? They pointed to the tree surrounding the perimeter of the mountain some of my friends were very agitated and stressed out, sitting on their haunches and looking scared. And then I saw why. Because in the trees were five or six mist-like shapes, about three feet tall, two feet off the ground, and whitish smoke in the shape of a lemon. But they would disappear and then reappear close to the mountain. I watched, mesmerized as the weird little clouds got closer and closer until they were right at the base of the mountain. 
Then, my friend, the girl of the group, screamed something like, they're coming for us. My friend who told me everything said, come on guys, we need to get out of here. And we just ran so fast down that mountain. When we got down the mountain, I noticed just how dark it suddenly was as well, when it was just light out before. At home, my mum and friends who had stayed behind were freaking out saying that they were about to come looking for us. They asked, where were you? We told them that we were on the mountain. We hadn't even finished one game of manhunt, but apparently we'd been gone for over four hours up to that point. I always wondered what happened to me and where did that growl come from? Why didn't I see it? How come I didn't hear my friend screaming my name for like ten minutes? What were those weird shapes and why were we missing time? I'm not sure I'll ever know, but maybe something similar has happened to you guys? Many years ago, when I must have been in about grade 5 or 6, my parents started working more, leading me to having to catch the bus and walk the rest of the way back to home. There was nothing bad about this, and I enjoyed the walks too. I'd been doing it for about a year, and each day I noticed the same guy parked in the driveway with this dark blue ute, and almost every time a, a cigarette in his mouth as well. I saw him two days in a row the first time, and thought nothing of him. A few days passed without me seeing him. Then the next week, I walked past the house, and his car was there with no one in it. I felt uneasy walking past it though and I noted a camera poorly hidden away just in front of the steering wheel. I pretended not to notice it but in my head I knew exactly why it was there and for the rest of the week the camera was there. At the end of the week he'd sit in his car and check his watch as soon as I'd walk by and I knew that he was trying to figure out the time that I came past him. I wanted to take a different route home, but I couldn't really do much else, and the only way would inevitably result in me walking past the house every time. And for maybe a month, he'd be sitting in his car, staring at me each time. I still don't know if he thought that I couldn't see him, because he was bad at being discreet. But then, one day, he was leaning on his car door, and as I walked past, he said something along the lines of, Hey mate, you need a ride home. And obviously I said no. He kept on trying to get a yes from me, but I didn't stop refusing. I could tell that he was getting mad, and he could tell that I knew it too, so he calmed down and said sorry. Next day, I see as you drive up behind me, he slows down as he comes next to me, and rolls down his window, asking me if I want to ride again. He drove off the first time I said no this time, and... It goes maybe uh, a week or two without seeing him, after I thought that I wouldn't see him again, but then he drives past again. He asked the exact same question, and when I refused, he told me to just get in the car. I said that I'm not going to get in, and he can leave me alone. He changed his tone a lot and said that he's got a gun. I lived in a small Australian city, and the chances of him having a gun are pretty much next to zero and it was easy to tell that he was trying to scare me. He then played it off as a joke after I was unfazed and leaned over and opened the door. Get in mate, it's much better in here than out there when it's so hot, right? I've got air conditioning and it's like 35 degrees outside. You'd probably know about stranger danger and all that, right? But I promise, that's not who I am. Come on, hop in. I remember that word for word and it scares me to think about it to this day. No, my, my house is right there. Just leave me alone, please, I said. The only problem was, my house was actually about a half a kilometer away at least. I proceeded to walk up the random house driveway and knock on the door. I had no idea who these people were. He stared as I waited for the door to open. I heard the doorknob turn and before the person could say anything, I bumped past them and went inside. Now that I think of it, it was probably just as dangerous to enter a random person's house other than a random person's car, but the man's expression changed and he sped off. That is, after the house owner glared at him. The owner was actually a really nice old woman and I said that he tried to convince me to get into his car. She called my parents and I waited outside of her house for them to arrive. 
My mum was really grateful and my dad was pretty much in shock. My mum then constantly visited the old lady as she lived alone and she wanted to be nice. And I never really thought about how lucky I was that the house that I entered was not the wrong one to go into in the first place. I try not to think about the whole experience because it genuinely terrifies me. I don't know what happened to the man because after that I never saw him again. And I definitely don't miss him. So this happened when my son was about two months old and also after the worst of a particularly bad hurricane hit but the power was still out. But my husband had gone to check on his parents since our cell phone provider towers weren't working and we couldn't get a hold of them. It was just my mother, me and my baby at home and it was time for my son to take a nap but his crib had actually been dripped on from a bust in our ceiling so he definitely wasn't going to go in there. I decided to put him on my spare twin bed because it's built into a little cubby in the wall so only one side is open and the rest of the edges are walls. I put him in the back left corner, gently swaddled, made a sizable L shape with my pregnancy pillows around him and then proceeded to add a sniffer buffer of thick pillows on the outside so our dog didn't wake him with her well-intended sniff checks. He still had quite a bit of clear space around him so there was no suffocation risk and I planned to be in the room with him the entire time anyway. I was getting ahead on my midterm study. So after a few minutes I stepped across the hallway to the bathroom but I left the door open so that I could still see the bed. I was mostly worried about the dog waking him. I looked down for a second to undo the button or the zipper on my jeans. And directly after I got them down I heard the shrill cry of my baby and immediately ran back into the room to find him on the floor, a solid five feet away from the right side of the bed. My mother had run in right behind me because she heard me scream. At the time, I was focused on loading him up and having my mum drive to the ER while I sat in the back with him, instead of thinking through what actually happened. He gets checked out and is given a perfect bill of health. We just have to watch for any changes in behavior and make him stir every 15 minutes when he's sleeping for the next 24 hours. And while I'm holding him close for his nap is when I start to think. I was gone for like under 30 seconds and had left him deeply sleeping and swaddled in the back left corner of the bed. When I came back, the swaddling blanket was lying on the right end of the bed, outside of the boundary that I'd made with pillows and loosely folded. None of the pillows were the slightest bit disturbed. Also, my son was on the floor, about five feet diagonally from the front right corner of the bed with his head facing the opposite way. But the biggest thing to me, however, is that there was no thud, no noise until he screamed. To do this, my son would have had to have completely unswaddled himself without losing his temper, which is extremely unlikely, put the blanket nicely on the complete other end of the bed, get down an approximately four foot drop without disturbing the pillow bumper, then move another 12 or so feet and lay down the opposite way. At two months old, babies can't really do anything but flail, much less even roll over like that. Also, the doctor even mentioned that it didn't look like he took a fall and a four foot drop would have surely done something. He never got red or developed a bruise. He didn't even cry for 20 seconds after I picked him up. He just went back to sleep. Literally, nothing had changed except for my baby's position. He didn't act hurt and it didn't sound like his pain cry, which I was very familiar with due to colic. He just seemed a bit startled and grumpy from being woken up suddenly like that. I still have no idea what happened exactly, but I'm just now beginning to stop holding my son during naps and it's been 17 months since it happened. It's something I still think about. At the time, it kept me up many nights. Back in my freshman year of college, I was a fairly trusting person and probably got myself into a lot of bad situations because of this. I was pretty dumb and very lucky, to be honest. But there was one incident, however, that will always remind me to have better situational awareness. So I was walking back to my dorm from a class in the early evening, speed walking because I had another class at night and wanted time to relax beforehand. 
I had my earbuds in, listening to music, and I passed a very tall, broadly built guy on the sidewalk as I was coming up to my door. I only took notice of him for a second because he was walking rather slowly and taking up the middle of the sidewalk. I had to step off onto the grass to get around, but I don't think that I did it rudely or anything. I probably would have forgotten him entirely if the following events didn't occur like they did, that is. So I crossed the street and walked up to my hall's entrance and swiped my key. They warn us not to allow others to tailgate because people unauthorized into the building can get in like that. No one followed this rule though and I didn't want to ever be rude and close the door on someone right behind me. But that's when I noticed the guy that I'd passed earlier was close enough for me to let him grab the door and let himself in, which I allowed, thinking again nothing of it because it's something I always do. I lived on the fifth floor, which was a girl's only floor. The genders were separated by floors, so floor four and floor six would be men's floors nearest to mine. He and I got onto the elevator with a few other people and I pressed the button for the fifth floor and noticed that he didn't press any numbers. That's fine, maybe he was getting off on the floors before mine like the others in the elevator. We stop at the second floor and a couple leaves. He doesn't get off. We stop again at the fourth floor and the remaining person leaves and he stays and now we're alone. It was at this point that I started to feel a bit funny. He wasn't standing too close or anything, but he seemed to be looking anywhere but at me as we rode up to the fifth floor. I didn't think it was too odd, but it could be explained by mere coincidence, I suppose. We step on my floor and I leave first, relieved to leave the awkward space and continue on my way. Now, my hall was a, a Y-shaped building, and upon leaving the elevator, you either went left or right down two separate wings. I turned left as my dorm is about in the center of the left wing. That's when I noticed that he was following behind me. And even when I picked up my pace, he kept up with me. Being taller, he wasn't exactly hurrying, but this was what really pushed my paranoia up. It really felt like he wasn't walking on his own with a destination in mind. And he could easily pass me if he wanted to, but no, he maintained a steady distance from me, which meant that I was being followed. I started to panic, and when I reached my door, I realized just how empty my floor was at this time of day. He was going to reach me just as I opened my door, and that's when I decided that it would be better to stay in a public space and scream if I needed to. I could also run further down the hall and down the stairs at the end of the wing if need be, if I opened my dorm door, it would be way too easy for him to just come in, lock the door, and overpower me. I always kept my keys in my pocket, but as he approached, I instead swung my backpack off my back so I could leave it if I needed to run, and fumbled around inside it as if searching for my keys. I don't know why I was trying to act cool as if I wasn't scared, and that I wasn't opening my door because I was terrified of him. Especially since, maybe, he might pass me and actually be visiting someone further down the hall, and wouldn't I look silly then? That's when he stopped though, just two yards away from me, past all the other doors, stopping at mine. He stood there for a moment, and I just ignored him, hand fumbling uselessly around in the inside of my backpack. I didn't look up, and then he turned and walked back down the way that he came, and I heard the elevator door open. Feeling safe to open my dorm door without fear that he might come charging back down the hallway, I hurriedly got inside and I locked the door. I immediately called my mother just in case, needing to feel not totally alone since my roommate wasn't home, and later I calmed down and waited until my roommate returned. I skipped my next class because I didn't want to walk in the dark. Initially I had felt good about my quick thinking, but then I realized one really bad important detail. I should have kept walking. I shouldn't have stopped at my door like that because now he knows which dorm is mine. I haven't seen him since then, but that doesn't mean that he won't come back. When I was around 5 or 6 years old, I'm 28 now, I used to be a bit of a crybaby and a spoiled kid. Whenever my parents go to work, I would cry and have a tantrum. 
So what my dad did was he always played with me before going to work. Usually hide and seek so that I won't realize immediately that they already went to work. But one day I'm having a tantrum. They still have to leave me again at my granny's house together with my aunt. And they took care of me while my parents work. So my dad told me that we'll play hide and seek. I remember being really excited so I closed my eyes immediately and started to count 1 to 10. Not realizing that they'd gone to work. In my young mind... He's hiding, so I need to find him. I searched through most of the house for my dad, and then, after some time, I took a peek at one of the bedrooms. I walked closer stealthily and went silently on the bed as I took a closer look at the hand. It was a bit grayish in color. I later realized that the hand is corpse-like, I suppose you could call it. But being a young kid, I didn't understand that, and I just kind of shook it off thinking that I finally found my dad, so I ready myself to surprise him. I shouted peekaboo as I jumped down to look under the bed. But when I did, nobody was there. Even as a kid, I felt my hair stand up on ends and I ran back to my grandma saying to her what I saw. That I saw my dad's hand under the bed when I peeked but he wasn't there. Grandma, thinking that I'm a child with a great imagination, shook it off and told me that we'll watch some cartoons and offered me something to eat. But to this day, I still think about that hand under the bed and exactly what it was attached to. This happened to me a few years ago while I was still in my hometown. I was going for a late night walk in the early AMs, which was fairly common and I always felt relatively safe and street smart to avoid bad situations. My walks would often take me all over town though a favorite haunt of mine was a park that we had down by the river, and although it was known as a hangout spot for weirdos and druggies so late, I've walked there plenty of times and never encountered any problems, so I went down there again all the same to enjoy the breezy river air. Now, the walk to the park itself was pretty much uneventful, but I need to explain the anatomy of the park itself, it was something vital to realize the magnitude of the issue with. The park was unfenced and easy to get into, open to the public. And looking from the park itself, you could see an opening to the beach and the river along it. There needed to be an opening because the beach was a bit of a drop-off. You had to take a moderate step down from the concrete supporting the park itself just to get onto the sand. And away from this opening, the disparity between the concrete steps and the beach became such a length that they needed fencing so as to prevent people from falling and hurting themselves. Basically, everywhere not the beach led to a major drop-off into only a sparse line of sand or muddy area, where the only thing separating you from the top was either fencing or a major tree line. So as I'm walking through the park though, there's nobody around and it's absolutely silent, until the hooting of an owl breaks it. I'm surprised because owls were rare in those parts and that time of year too, but I ignored it and continued my walk as it continues hooting. But as I meandered closer to where it was sounding, I noticed two things. That the owl sounded like it was in pain, and that it must have been on the ground. I get really concerned for it and want to help it, so I start going over to where the hooting is coming from. Though tentatively, because even right then, a weird chill sort of climbed up my spine, though I couldn't say why. I get closer and it sounds louder, more hurt and is definitely on the ground for sure in the same place. I keep walking closer and hear it right behind the tree line after the drop off point. For more of the park's layout as well, anywhere past the tree line led to a drop that was just a thin line of earth separating you from the water, like a gorge sort of. If you did jump down you were pretty much relatively stuck because you couldn't go forward because of the water. Climbing back up was a bit of a nightmare too sometimes because of all the trees and the roots jutting out. And going left or right would have forced you to follow an extremely narrow path with little room. But from what I could tell, this owl was right behind the drop-off point, so even getting closer, I, I just couldn't see it. The owl kept hooting though, and I got to the point where I was right in front of the trees and could hear it right under me. All I had to do was jump off and I would see it. And be able to get to it. But I didn't. Because the weird feeling. 
it chilled up my back again, and it kept getting higher and higher and more and more intense the closer I got, and my conscious brain just finally picked up on something. I started counting. One, two, three, all the way to ten, and the owl hooted. Again, I counted one, two, three, all the way to ten, and it hooted again, and I did this again, and it sounded again, and again and again it went like this. And then I finally realized why I felt so creeped out, and why my subconscious brain was screaming at me to get out of there. It wasn't an owl at all. It was a recording. A recording of a wounded owl, on the ground, waiting for anyone to come with the intention to help it past a tree line obscuring their vision, past a drop-off point that you couldn't climb back up from, and on a path that you couldn't run in at all, where someone, anyone, could be waiting and hiding. It was a lure for sure, meant to lead someone into a trap. And I suddenly felt very, very cold and clammy, and like I was being watched. I immediately turned at this, started speed walking away, taking the nearest exit out of the park and onto as many lit streets as I could all the way home, constantly checking to see if I was being followed. I stayed up the entire night, fully paranoid, and looking at all the windows that I could see if anyone was there, though nothing bad ever did happen and no one ever did try to get me. The next night, I actually went back with my sister's cell phone with the intent to call the police and report it if I heard it again, but no hooting ever occurred, and upon more thorough inspection, nobody seemed to be lying in wait. I kept an eye on the newspapers for a bit after that too, to check if anyone else reported similar happenings, or God forbid, if anyone got hurt in a similar incident. But nobody ever did, and it never happened to me again. I do continue to take night walks these days, but I always carry a weapon on me to defend myself now, and always, always make a point to trust my instincts. When I was 11 or 12, our home actually got broken into in the middle of the night one night. We lived in a middle class suburb, so we really didn't have any worries about crime or anything. My school bus would never drop me off at my house. Well, we lived in a sort of loop, so the driver would always drop me off at the beginning of the loop. And not that big of a deal, because the actual stop was maybe 10 houses down from mine anyway. But one day, I saw a grey Tacoma. I didn't really pay much attention to it. You know, I was young and didn't think about these kinds of things anyway. Well, we didn't find out until after, but the man had been sitting on the side of the road watching me come home from school and watching when my mum would come home from work. But my dad is a firefighter, and due to his schedule, the day that the break-in happened, he wasn't at home. So, it was a Saturday night, and nothing was really happening. We had our normal family night, my older brother had come over that night, and he got into an argument with his wife, so he stayed with us. And if he hadn't have done that, I really don't know if I would have been writing this right now. Around 2am, our back window crashes. I wake up and I'm about to run to my mum's room when I hear my brother screaming at someone. My brother was a cop at the time and he was armed and he stopped this man as soon as he entered our kitchen. He held him there till the police arrived. After they investigated, they released information to my mum and she only just recently told me about what they actually found. Apparently, he broke in with a backpack that contained rope, zip ties, and a knife. On his phone, he had some, well, explicit photos of children and had pictures of me and my mother from our windows and us coming home from school and work. He went to jail for quite a long time. Now that I'm older, I am so thankful that my brother was home that night because if he wasn't, I may not be. When I was an infant, my parents decided that it was time to buy a house. They bought in one of those developments that was yet to be built. When the house was completed, we moved in. Of course, I was too young to remember any of this, though. But when I got to about age 5 or 6, or whatever age you have to be to go up and down stairs alone, I realized that I was terrified of our basement. 
I wasn't afraid of the dark or anything, or other basements, just our one. Very specifically too, a spot beside the furnace where my mother had a pantry shelf of canned goods. I know that this is going to sound weird, but it always felt like something was reaching for me there. It was angry and wanted to grab me as well. The feeling never really went away. My dad built a rec room down there, but I still sprinted past the furnace spot to get to it. If I was asked to get a can, if I was asked to get a can from the pantry shelf, I'd just grab it and run upstairs at top speed. I was told off all the time for running on the stairs, but that was nothing compared to the feeling the spot gave me. But we moved and the dreaded basement faded into memory. When I was an older teen, some neighbors my parents were friends with in our old home came to visit us. After saying hi, I went up to my room and the adults chatted while having a few drinks. I started going downstairs again later and heard the husband of this neighbor's couple say, it was such a shame what happened when they were building your house. And my dad agreed. I froze where I was and sort of eavesdropped on them. When our house was being built, a young boy was allegedly fooling around on the back of some excavator type machine. He fell and was crushed to death by it. Apparently, they were digging up the foundation of our home, that same basement. I would put money on the exact spot that he died on, although there's no real way to prove it, I suppose. I was alive, though, and he was dead. He wasn't happy about that. I was a daredevil kind of kid who routinely did stupid stuff that could have killed me or injured me for sure. Did that make him hate me or something? Did he think that he could take my living body for himself? I don't know. All I know is that something angry reached for me down there, for sure. Anyway, I entered the living room and they shut up. I quietly said, and you laughed at me in my imagination. I knew that something was down there. I just knew it. Why did you deny that? You could have cut the air with a knife. And then my dad said, that we didn't want to scare you. No one else in my family ever felt anything down there. It kind of felt good to find out what my problem was. And this was the start of knowing I felt things that others didn't. <laughs>